Welcome everybody, happy Monday morning. Um, I'm, I'm hoping this is the first week that we get back to have a full normal week um, after everything that's happened. I felt like yesterday, last week still felt a little crazy. Um, I wanna welcome you to our eighth um, Under the Dome session. And uh, we're so delighted to, to continue these conversations, uh, even amidst a lot of chaos. And um, just wanna thank our sponsors for the series. They are HNTB, the Goodman Corporation, EHRA, and Memorial Hermann Hospital System. We really appreciate your support for the series. I also want to take a minute to thank our mobility partners. They are our uh, year-long um, invested partners, and we really appreciate your support so we can continue our advocacy throughout the year. I did want to remind everybody to ask questions throughout the program. Uh, you can message me directly in the chat box. If you want to ask the question, please let me know, or I can ask it for you. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, really delighted this morning to have uh, Chair uh, Tom Oliverson with us. Um, he is representing House District 130, uh, largely the Cyprus area. Um, he currently serves as Chair of Insurance and is on the House Administration and Public Health Committees and has a whole wealth of experience from, from prior sessions. Um, he has been a partner with TAG for our advocacy days in prior sessions. Uh, joining us at the Stephen F. Austin for uh, for remarks and uh, those gatherings that we miss so much um, that we know we'll, we'll have back uh, by the time next session rolls around. Um, he is a professional anesthesiologist. Um, it, every time I, I see that, it reminds me of a joke that one of my professors said her husband was an anesthesiologist and um, she would joke that he would, you know, literally put people to sleep. And that's how, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't very fun and exciting. He would literally put people to sleep. And he said, well, I may put one person to sleep at a time, but you put a whole classroom to sleep at a time. So anyways, it always reminds me of that joke. So I just wanted to share that to have some levity on a, on a Monday morning. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Chairman Tom Oliverson. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea. I appreciate that very much. And since we're, we're joking about anesthesia, I'll throw a couple of my own out there. I, um, I remember uh, two sessions ago, uh, Joe Strauss said something very similar in his opening remarks about uh, being invited to speak at a meeting uh, with John Zerwas and Tom Oliverson and of anesthesiologists. And his wife, Julie, said, you're going to a meeting to talk in front of a group of anesthesiologists? And he said, yes. And she said, well, I've, I've heard you speak many a time, and I think you're going to fit right in. Um, and then, of course, the, there's the age-old joke of the, you ask the anesthesiologist how much he charges uh, to put you to sleep, and he says that's complimentary. However, I do charge to wake you back up again. Oh, very good. Um, yes. So, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of those jokes. We could just yes. go on and on and on, but we won't. Um, before I get started, too, I should just say I see a lot of friends uh, on the call here. So good morning to Rob and to T. Wayne and Freddie and Ashley and Heather and Jeff um, and Jack. It's great to, to see you all. Um, always good to have a lot of constituents on the call with you. Um, so, you know, this is a very strange session. This is my third session. I've never seen anything like this. I suspect if you talk to Chairman Guerin or, or, um, uh, or our Dean Craddock, Speaker Craddock, he'd probably tell you he'd never seen anything like this either. Um, it's just really, bizarre, right? And so we got off to a slow start, and then we had the ice storm, uh, which put us even further behind the eight ball. And so now I think what you're going to see is normally we have this steady ramp up, and then we sort of go over the edge, and it's the roller coaster straight down like the old uh, Texas cyclone we used to have in, at Astro World, right, where you go over that first hill, and then it's just straight down. I think that started uh, this week. I just think that uh, right now the chairs who are trying to get their committees organized are in free fall, trying to get everything rolling. I think you're gonna see that in the weeks to come though, it's gonna get super busy around here because we're gonna have to play a lot of catch up. One of the things that's preoccupying my thoughts right now is just the fact that even though we have less bills filed this session, you know, we still, are up in the 2,500 area or 20, 2,000s already. Um, we're supposed to start hearing bell, bills next week, but so far we've only referred about 500 bills. So in my own committee of house insurance, you know, um, when you're looking for uncontroversial good bills that you can 
here, vote out quickly, get to the calendar, get everybody's, you know, feet wet kind of thing, which is what we normally do. It's kind of slim pickings. Um, and so we're trying to sort of figure that out. I've, I've heard a couple of folks on the Senate side remark that if it's not sort of agreed to, if it's not sort of high priority and everybody kind of recognizes that, you know, there just may not be a lot of bandwidth to get stuff through some of these committees. I, I look at my good friend and, and, uh, and partner in, in crime on a lot of these great health care bills, uh, Chairman Hancock over in the Senate, and, you know, he and I work really well together on a number of insurance issues. And, of course, I've got all these insurance issues, but that poor man's got insurance issues. He's got workers' comp issues. He's got business and industry issues. And now he's got ice storm issues on top of that. So you have to ask yourself, in, you know, as we're sprinting towards May now, how many productive hearings can you possibly squeeze out for everybody's, you know, sort of pet project individual priority bill versus now we have all these big issues that, that must get done and are going to suck a lot of oxygen out of the room. It'll be interesting to see how that all goes. Um, the budget's looking better, I think, than what we thought. At least that's what I'm told. I'm obviously not in, on the appropriations committee, but I'm the only other doctor in the house who sits right next to me on the house floor and I converse frequently and, and he's in a position to know what's going on with the budget. So I think we're, I think we're gonna be, you know, it's not just gonna be gobs and gobs of money and you know, everybody money raining from the skies and expanding this program and adding more money here and doing this and that and the other thing, we'll probably still have to make some choices. But I don't think it's going to be this massive gaping hole like we were worried that it was going to be. Um, so I think that should be encouraging to, to everybody, um, particularly on this call as we look at things like transportation funding and, you know, a lot of these projects that require state dollars in order to get them done. Um, I don't think it's going to be as lean of a year as we thought it was going to be. It may still, I'm not saying you're going to be, you're going to be exactly on, you know, no one will be untouched, but I think it'll be better than we thought it was going to be. Uh, so in our committee, you know, we deal with, I deal with every type of insurance that's sold in Texas with the exception of workers' comp. And so, um, we have TWIA issues to deal with. We have health insurance issues to deal with. We're going to have some property casualty issues to deal with. It, it's very likely that this storm that we recently experienced from a loss perspective to the property casualty industry could end up being a higher price tag than even Hurricane Harvey was. Um, when you consider the amount of homes that were likely damaged uh, in businesses, um, even my church there in Cyprus was damaged uh, as a result of busted pipes and stuff like that. Um, so I think the effects will be wide ranging <clears throat> and we'll, we'll have to keep a close eye on, on how that affects, you know, just in terms of how these claims are handled, how they're paid, but also what effect that has on the marketplace going forward. Um, obviously we had some hearings last week talking about what went wrong. Um, I don't know how much, of that y'all were able to watch. I watched some. I couldn't watch all. I, I begged the chairs today for a Cliff Notes version and please uh, summarize your conclusions for us so that we can know kind of what, what our marching orders are and talking points as far as what was seen. But I think, you know, the bottom line is that everybody's focused on this period of time that began at 11.58 p.m. on Sunday night and stretched into the early morning hours where ERCOT you know, went from a, a level of concern to a level of, you know, the, the house is on fire, somebody put it out. Um, and that happened in such a short period of time. So I think you'll probably see some changes to the way things are done and maybe even some changes to the people making those decisions based on what we heard last week. And, you know, the, the point would be, is, as I've told my constituents, this was a never event never should have happened and it will never happen again. Um, and, and I mean that, and I think all 181 of us up here mean that when we say that we're just despondent about what happened uh, two weeks ago and don't ever want to see that happen again, whatever it is we need to do to prevent. It. So um, 
you know, busy session, going to be real, uh, I think, fast paced from here on out. I, I don't think we're going to have sort of this lazy march where we kind of slowly ramp up to a budget. I think it's going to get crazy rather quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll be interesting to see how much work we can get done in the time that we have remaining. And so with that, I guess I'll just uh, pause here and, and open it up for some questions because I, I actually enjoy the question and answer stuff more than just sort of droning on about stuff. I don't want you all to fall asleep. So. Well, well, before we, before we dive into our questions, um, I have a request from your good friend T. Wayne. So he'll wake everybody up. No oh, good. <laughs> His flashy outfit. Whatever he's got on today, he'll wake everybody up. He, he is always one of the sharpest dressed people. Always. Between him and Freddie Warner are, are two of the sharpest dressed folks I know. I, I just, I just wear what's laid on the bed. Hey, Freddie, what do you think of those? Man, I need some of those. <laughs> you guys are flashy for a Monday morning. I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah. I'm impressed. yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, 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 as, a, as a constituent of. Uh, House District 130, I, I just want to thank you for, for not only being a great representative of the people of Cypress, Waller, Tomball area, but also for being such a quality father, family man, and all around Christian. I mean, you're a great representation of our district, and, and I couldn't be prouder for you to be our representative in Austin. And thank you very much for everything you do. We, we really do appreciate you. Thanks, appreciate you. you. Thank thank you. you. So, so T Wayne is one of your constituents. So that's I, yes. I, that, I think that could, be, that could be helpful, but also you know it's a lot. I feel like that would be a lot because you you know he's very engaged. So mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's a great active. guy. And let me just say this, and and he's not the only one on this call that felt, falls into this category, but but engaged, active constituents that actually tell me what's going on in their industry and and kind of help me figure figure out what the needs are make my job so so much easier. It is, it is really hard to be a good representative when people don't talk to you about what is going on in their life, what's going good, what they're struggling with, and what they need. Um, that just makes my job a, a hundred thousand times easier. Well, we appreciate, we do appreciate T. Wayne, all joking aside, T. Wayne knows we have a lot of love for, for him. So he's, yes, very engaged, very involved. And uh, if, I, if I have a question, I know who to go to. So <laughs> I'll, I'll give you my opinion and it'll be honest whether you want it or not. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that is, that is true. Uh, thanks to you, Wayne. Um, I know uh, Freddie actually had a, a question. Uh, I think he's still on Freddie. Let me make sure I'm muted. Dr. Alderson, you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. How are you? I'm good, Freddie. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Question for you regarding the um, the failure of Congress to be able to pass any liability protection language in its COVID relief. Do you think y'all will have an opportunity to pursue some of that in the context of, of your state legislative work this session in lieu of the feds doing anything about it? I am I am 99% confident, Freddie, that we will have a comprehensive liability protection bill for COVID that will pass this session. I've awesome. heard the speaker and the lieutenant governor list that as a priority. You heard the, the governor talk about it in his state of the state address. Um, that, that is top of the top of the list of things um, that we feel as legislature is critically important to making sure that our business economy continues to recover. We cannot have this specter of, you know, what if hanging over everybody's head. Um, so yes, I would point out also, I think it's interesting just as an encouragement, if you're feeling a little discouraged, that the National Council of Insurance Legislators, which is a group of legislators like me that do insurance work from all 50 states, adopted a model policy uh, two Fridays ago that basically provides comprehensive liability protection um, in the midst of the pandemic for businesses. So even, right. even, you know, and so those are blue states, red states, purple states, big states, small states, western states, eastern states, northern, southern states, all come together and said, this is important, this has to get done. So I, I feel like there's a consensus around the country 
despite the fact that the federal government, you know, occasionally drops the ball, um, that the states feel like this is really important and they're going to get it done. Super. Thank you. Thanks. For those on the call, can you can you just kind of give a, a snippet, just kind of one 30 second, you know, your the pitch for for what this means for businesses? I know it's a lot of detail, but as much as you can kind of summarize. Chairman or Freddie, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I think I guess my my thought on this is is just, you know, businesses in order to get to a point to where we're back to, you know, some sense of normalcy again, whether you're in a hospitality or you're an engineering firm or you're a hospital or whatever it is that you do, um, those liability protections become critical. Let me give you a really good example from my own industry of healthcare. And that is that as Freddie and Ashley would tell you, um, the hospitals have been struggling since the pandemic, not with minimizing the spread of the virus, which we've done an exceptional job at. Um, in fact, it, it turns out that less than 1%, based on the data I've been able to assemble, of hospital employees that acquire the virus actually acquired at work. 99% of them are getting it somewhere else. So we're doing an excellent job of containment. But the problem is we have people dying uh, or, you know, or just very sick in our hospitals across the Houston area um, that are unable to visit with loved ones because of concerns of liability. Right. Um, and so, you know, what, what does a li comprehensive liability bill mean to a hospital system or a healthcare facility? Well, I mean, it, it could be the difference between, you know, mom being admitted with a stroke, being able to have her husband come in and sit in the room with her and spend time with her and basically only being able to do that by Zoom. By Zoom. And I mean, and if you think about something that is, is truly basic uh, and truly critical and, and fundamental to our human existence, we have always recognized the importance, especially if someone is dying, of being able to be surrounded by loved ones, Right. Being able to have your faith leader come in and help you get right with your with God, so you, you know as you're transitioning from one world to the next. I mean, those are pretty fundamental things in human existence, going back many thousands of years. And right. COVID has messed that all up because of the liability. Okay. Uh, so it's critical. Um, I'd love to hear from some of the engineers um, out there. You know how how they see the liability protection for them. Um, but I just tell you from healthcare, that's, that's what I see. No, I think that's really helpful. And I appreciate that because I, I wanted to understand specific situations where we're thinking of a liability business and, and that's a liability that strikes a, a very personal chord with people as well, right? No matter where, where you are in business or not having a business of your own, that's a, that's a significant, we all know, we know somebody that had to experience that. I think we can all kind of point to somebody that, that had to experience that with a loved one. Um, so in, in follow-up to your question, are, I don't know if there are any engineers on, I know there are engineers on. <laughs> I know there's <laughs> engineers on because I have a lot of constituents who are engineers. So um, I would be interested if, if, if anybody would want to volunteer and talk about that, the liability piece of it and how it would impact um, their business. Otherwise, I'm just going to have the chairman start calling you out. <laughs> I've raised, I've raised my hand. You haven't recognized me. Oh, I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. Go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> Good morning. You asked, you asked for an opinion, so you're going to get one. <laughs> um, yeah, so for us, this is, the problem is, is such a uh, emotional uh, uh, decision that uh, uh, we try to go by what medical experts tell us, right? We try to, so it's like specifically, for example, to opening offices. So we ask our people to come to the office. But then there's always this one person who is, or, or, or two, that are just not comfortable going anywhere. They're not comfortable coming to the office. It doesn't matter what, to, it doesn't matter what uh, uh, measures you put in. It doesn't matter, you know, the stations, the distancing, the masks, the require. It just doesn't matter. Somebody just, I would say that like all, an almost irrational fear uh, uh, of that. So. 
So one, once you do that, then from a business standpoint, you can say, okay, well, this is, and, and, and from a legal standpoint, you're allowed to, uh, you know, this is what we can accommodate, take it or leave it. At some point, it's going to get to that, to that level. Now, we try not to get there, okay? We try to accommodate as much as we can because we know it's emotional. Um, but the way I see it is, if you do some kind of requirement and something happens to that person, I think it opens it up for us from a liability perspective quite a bit. So we're, we're pretty, um, what's the word, concerned about what the possible implications are. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Was there anybody else? I didn't, if I, if I missed a hand raised, I apologize. Um, well, I encourage you uh, to think about it beyond today and, of course, share those types of in incidences and situations uh, with the chairman um, because it seems like, he, you know, I mean, they, they really want to hear, he really wants to hear, um, you know, how this impacts you. Um, so I want to shift a little bit to uh, transportation. I loved your 99%, which is 99.9 .9 or 99% sure <laughs> about the liability. And I'm wondering what else you're 99% sure about for this session because. <laughs> There aren't a lot of guarantees these days. And uh, so I'm just kind of curious what else you felt was, you know, lock steady. And then we'll move, we'll move to some more transportation detailed stuff. But um, just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, well, I'm 99% I'm sure that we'll, I'm 100% sure we'll pass a budget. That's okay. the one thing I'm 100% okay. sure of. <laughs> I'm 99% sure that we're going to have some legislation that's going to reform the way PUC and ERCOT do their job so that we can right. not have another ice storm. Um, and there may be other things sort of that look at from the generation side or from the distribution side. Um, if there are certain errors that were uncovered, inefficiencies or just communication problems uh, that need to be addressed. Um, I don't know if y'all heard this, but I, I, this was one of those ones that was just like gobsmacking to me, um, was when the PUC commissioners stated that during this crisis, she was really unable to communicate with other members of the board or with ERCOT because of the Open Meetings Act. And the fact that you, you can't you can't, and we deal with this in the legislature too, right? I can't, I can't, um, so I'm trying to get, I have five members on my committee who have never done insurance before. For, so for a nine member committee to have five members who've never been on insurance before, they got a lot of learning to do, right? right. Um, so we're trying to get them in front of TDI and they're doing this insurance 101 stuff and we're working through all of this. Well, we had to break it up. We couldn't just do one thing because if we had five members on a Zoom call all together of a committee talking about insurance at the same time, that's a quorum. Right. And so we have to give public notice and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I'm sure you all deal with this in, in some of your, you know, your dealings as well and what you do um, from an engineering standpoint. Um, that's a problem. Right. When when you can't communicate with other team members during a crisis without worried about triggering a criminal penalty for a violation of a, of a law that was basically designed to promote transparency, but probably obviously has some unintended consequences here. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's insane um, in, to my way of thinking that we would allow something like that to get in the way of crisis management. So uh, that you know, that something like that's obviously going to have to be addressed. Um, let's not forget that we're also in the midst of a pandemic. We're kind of coming off the tail end of that, I hope. I keep hearing promising things, um, but, you know, the virus is still out there. And, you know, I, I think we learned a lot through 2020 about how Chapter 418, which is the chapter of code that concerns disaster declarations, you know, how a pandemic may be very different than mm -hmm. a, um, a hurricane or a tornado or, you know, something like that, right? It's just, I think we all could point to at least a dozen things off the top of our head and just say, well, that's, this 
is very different, this pandemic thing. I don't think chapter 418 was ever written with this in mind. Right. Um, so basically we have a, a bill uh, that was filed last week, it's House Bill 3, mm -hmm. that basically tries to amalgamate a lot of these concerns uh, with respect to businesses, places of worship, you know, gatherings, um, and, and really tries to sort of push back, narrow, define, deal with some of these inconsistencies and sort of overreaches of government and sort of, you know, bizarre ways of dealing with things that there may be occurred at the local level, maybe occurred at the state level, but just kind of in retrospect, you know, maybe that wasn't the best way to handle that. Um, and so it's got a property tax component and it's got a, you know, a church and, and business component and it's got, it sort of ties in a whole bunch of these things, but it's basically looking at this whole disaster declaration, but specific to pandemic. So I think that that's another one. I'm 99.9% .9 confident that that's going to pass. And I think that's going to be really good for taxes because I think we really need that. We need that clarification when you're talking about a disaster declaration that a, you know, 18 months and counting or whatever it's going to end up being pandemic. I guess we're coming up on about a year right now, right? So right. we started yeah. having all these restrictions. That really doesn't fit the mold for what that chapter was designed to do. And right. so we need to, we need something different. I think that is a for sure thing. Um, well, mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, continue. I'm, I'm going to hold my question. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, so, and, and, um, you know, we're going to be working on some healthcare issues. I think we made some good strides last session as far as dealing with surprise medical billing and sort of starting to unlock the, right. the hidden box that is why are prescription drugs so expensive. Um, I, I will, spoiler alert, I don't think we're expanding Medicaid this session. I, I hope none of you were, are terribly surprised by that. Right. Um, but I, I just don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but there are going to be some things that we're going to work very strongly to improve the number of choices in the marketplace so that people can get access to the coverage that they need or the, you know, the discounts that they need. Um, I'm working on some pretty ambitious stuff as far as price transparency and pharmaceutical pricing and trying to get discounts to consumers. And so, you know, we'll sort of see where we go with that. But I think at the end of the day, I hope that we'll have another session like last session where we'll make some significant gains that help make lives better for all Texas uh, people that are, you know, engaged in that healthcare sphere of things in terms of making their dollars go farther, making things easier to understand, making care more accessible to them. Okay, that's great. We've got a few other questions that have popped up. Um, and this is great because I, I, I know we, we, we want to focus on transportation, right? But I think it's so helpful. And in some ways, I think these conversations are more helpful when we don't always talk about the full the full hour of transportation because it helps us to understand the context of how the policies and the bills that we're trying to think about fit into the larger picture and why things take as long as they do or why other priorities um, you know come up sooner and certainly COVID was already a huge uh, uh, footprint on the session right and then the freeze and 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 just everything and so. It, it really does shift a lot of priorities. So we appreciate that. So with that, I am gonna go, Rob has a question um, related to the, I think it was at the prescription. Surprise healthcare billing. Surprise Good morning, healthcare. Rob. Good morning, sir, how are you? I'm great, how are you, my friend? I'm very good. I'd like to echo what T. Wayne said. Thank you for your service and really everything that, that T. Wayne said was echoes from the entire district, right? You're just a great man. Thank you. Um, so I, I have documented proof of a person that I know that went in for a one hour, less than one hour scheduled procedure to have a nerve test done on their foot. And then afterwards received an explanation of benefits, you know, months later for $28,000 for a one hour outpatient scheduled procedure, not a health, not an emergency clinic by any means, just a scheduled. So as an engineer, I mean, how do I get to do that? <laughs> I would, I would love to be able to build somebody for an hour for $28,000. Now, since that first explanation of benefits, it's come down to like 20,000, but it's still outrageous. It's not a bill, um, but 
what is being done about things like that? I know there's a bill, I believe, pending to publish rates ahead of time or something along that lines. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So great question, Rob. So, um, so let me just back up and give you sort of a 10,000 foot overview because I think the example you give is great. Um, and, and I'm sympathetic, you know, from your, for what you're saying about, gosh, as an engineer, how do I do that? You know, the, the great dysfunction that we have in the healthcare industry, in my opinion, is the fact that it doesn't function like any other sector of our economy. Um, imagine if you went to go buy a car and you found the car you wanted and you were ready to sign on the dotted line and, and pay and whatever. And the, and the salesperson said, you don't, you don't pay now. You, you're going to drive the car for 30 days and then we're going to tell you how much it costs you. I mean, would you ever agree to that in a million years? No, of course not. No, you'd, you'd want to know like, okay, I'm not buying this car until you tell me how much it's going to cost. Not how much your MSRP is, but how much is it going to cost me? What am I going to have to pay? How much is this coming out of my pocket? Um, and, and that information is just really not available to consumers in the healthcare industry, and it's sad. Um, about the only way that you can ever get an upfront price is if you're paying cash. And then that's sort of negotiated ahead of time. And so you kind of know exactly what you're going to pay, and, you know, whether it, and, um, you know, I, we see this not infrequently in, in anesthesia with surgery, when people have cosmetic surgery, um, they know exactly what their breast augmentation or their facelift is going to cost ahead of time, because that's been agreed upon and there's a price and the price for the doctor that's doing the surgery, the anesthesia provider, as well as the facility charge is pre-negotiated. And that's pretty much the only time we ever see that. Okay. Um, I do think that it's time that from the healthcare industry perspective, and I'm speaking as a healthcare provider, I do think it's time that we become willing to compete on price and quality, just like every other sector of the economy. I know confidently that the facilities that I work at, like Memorial Hermann, um, can compete on price and quality. I know my anesthesia group, U.S. anesthesia partners, we can compete on price and quality. I know the surgeons that I work with, Surgical Group of the Woodlands, for example, mm -hmm. they can compete on price and quality. And, and the consumers have just really been locked out of that. And it's frustrating and it's unfortunate. Um, and I think it drives a tremendous part of, you know, the, the just sort of unnecessary healthcare costs, right? It's it's pretty, I mean, it, it's kind of insane to think that you could charge $28,000. I was surprised when you said it only came down to 20,000 because I was pretty sure you were gonna say it came down to 3,000 um, because those, Not that's, yet. you know, oftentimes how that, how that works. Um, so, and whether so we're talking consumer, about hospitals or we're talking about pharmaceutical um, companies and what they sell their drugs for, there are all these discounts that are built into the system that drive up the, the cost, right? That the, the sticker price is reflective of the discount that you're gonna have to pay in order to move the service. Just like if you buy a GM car, um, you know, there's a, you're like, well, why does this truck cost $70,000? I mean, I could get a Mercedes SUV for that. Well, you don't pay that because there's a $20,000 manufacturer rebate built into that price. So then of course you see that those sticker prices now are not as reliable, but what about for the consumer that doesn't have access to those rebates? That's what we see in the pharmaceutical space a lot of times is that if you don't have a prescription discount program that you're a member of, you pay that full freight, which is that grossly inflated wholesale price, um, you know, for the insulin or whatever. So, yeah, I, I think that, that that is something that we're working on. Um, I would say that, you know, this is not new territory, right? The federal government has waded into this over the last couple of years. Um, we have the benefit now of sort of seeing Trump's executive order on price transparency go into effect. And we're starting to get some data and we're starting to get some feedback and like well, what's working and what's not working. Um, but I think that that's a, that's a useful construct to look at. And when we say, like, what does transparency look like? Well, 
I think what it looks like is that I ought to be able as a consumer, let's just say I want to have my knee operated on, I need to have a torn meniscus fixed. I ought to be able to get a price from the surgeon, from the anesthesia provider and from the facility. And I ought to be able to shop that around. Um, well, as a I think consumer that's really important, of, Rob. Yeah, as a consumer of healthcare services and a provider of engineering services, um, I think every engineer on the call is waiting for me to say this, but we should be selecting based on quality first, right? And uh, price second, because I don't want some schlep giving me anesthesiologist who's handing me a bottle of whiskey instead of what you do, right? So. So I agree with you. And that has always been kind of the bugaboo in this whole thing. And, and I'm sure our healthcare friends would, would agree with me that the hard part of quality um, oftentimes is figuring out in a complex system like healthcare, what's, what's within your control and what's beyond your control and how to, how to, you know, sort of separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, and actually get to the difference between quality um, and non-quality and, and how also sometimes just patients' overall well-being and sort of just luck of the draw can come in and sort of screw that up for you and make it difficult to separate quality from non-quality. Um, in anesthesia, you know, there has been multiple permutations since I started my practice in the early 2000s and trying to figure out, you know, what does a quality anesthesia provider look like? Well, you know, I mean, I think some things are obvious, right? Obviously you wake up at the end of the surgery, that's important. <laughs> we could start there. Um, so so avoiding certain complications like death or brain damage or serious bodily injury, that's important. But then it becomes more subtle things like, you know, what about how well was your pain and your nausea controlled after anesthesia? You know, were you throwing up the whole time in the recovery room? Did you end up having to be admitted to the hospital because your pain was not well controlled? Um, you know, what, what, was the, what was the process like as far as your interaction with that provider? You know, one of the big parts about what I do is, can you put somebody at ease as they're about to go into what may be the most stressful thing of their entire life? Can you help them find comfort? Can you allay their concerns? Can you empathize with them so that they know that they're going to be okay? Um, those are all things, they're, they're kind of hard to measure, right? Because it's basically subjective, um, but those are important parts of, of what we do. So yeah, I, I think you're right. I think quality becomes really important. Um, I think fortunately we've made great strides in healthcare over the last 20 years in terms of identifying what quality looks like and how to how to score that, whether it be a press gainy or a survey vitals or something like that. We can we can micro target patients now and very specifically ask them questions about their interaction with the healthcare system. And we can get back highly specific provider specific information that is useful to our hospital partners and our surgeon partners. We're going to talk about anesthesia land now that we can actually show them on paper what our quality actually looks like. Um, and I think that we, we could make that available. Right. Sure. Uh, and I think that would help. It is interesting to me going back to the cosmetic surgery example that nobody ever has a problem determining who a good quality, you know, breast augmentation surgeon is right. There's a, there's a quality metric for that, and it's called photographs before and after. And that's why you find on a lot of the surgeon's websites, or if you go in to see a cosmetic surgeon, you know, they take pictures of their patients so that they can prove the quality of their work. Um, and then people can decide whether this is really a $20,000 surgery, you know, is this surgeon worth that, or is he more of a $7,000 surgeon that's masquerading as a $20,000 surgeon? Very good. Well, thank you, doctor. Hope to see you soon. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Yeah, these are great. These are, I mean, it's, I think it's an illustration of just how complicated all of these topics are. So um, thank you for that. I know our chairman is on, Mustafa. Um, he had a question, um, I think a little bit of a follow-up question, and then I know we do want to save some time for transportation. I think we're going to have to schedule a part two with you because everybody really has a lot of interest in a lot of the other expertise that you have. So Mustafa? Chairman, uh, good, good to talk to you. Thank you for being here today. Uh, I, I have similar conversations with your, with your partner, uh, Dr. Zafran, all the time, who's a, who's a dear friend. 
Uh, Dirk Brand as well, yes. What you were talking about uh, earlier on the uh, on insulin cost, can you talk a little bit about like the cost of insulin that's gone up over the last 20, 30 years? And there hasn't been any change to the drug. It, it, is, it is a generic drug for the most part, but the cost has just escalated. Is there anything that's gonna happen in what you're working on that is the insulin cost? So short answer to your question, Mustafa, is yes, that is my goal. Um, we have some very, very aggressive things that we're working on to make insulin more affordable. Um, we've seen a number of states take different approaches to doing this. Uh, this is something that's been on my radar screen now for a couple of years. Um, and aggressively, yes, we... Um, that That is my, my number one priority is to get a more affordable, not just insulin, but insulin obviously is, is the poster child because as you point out, uh, and correctly so, you know, there, there I think are only three manufacturers left of insulin in the United States. Um, the price has gone up for a 30 day supply. Uh, I, I will tell you that my understanding of the, of the reasons behind that is it is a little complex. It's not just as simple as sort of that, um, I forget which company it was that that Wall Street guy that bought that one drug and you know just realized he had a monopoly and just raised the price you know ten thousand percent. It's not quite that simple. Um, one of the issues that we run into in the pharmacy space in general, and this was one of the things that we looked at with twenty five thirty six that I passed last session, is that within within any uh, medication the bigger the rebate that you have to offer to Medicare or Medicaid or to large employers, the higher that wholesale acquisition cost is for everybody that doesn't have access to that program. In other words, it's the difference between buying a Honda truck or a GM truck. If you're buying the Honda truck, you know you're probably gonna get maybe a couple thousand dollars off of the MSRP and that's what you're gonna get, right? Because they price it, you're getting what you pay for. On the GM side though, it's not uncommon to see them offer 14,000, 15,000, sometimes 20,000 off the MSRP. Well, that's baked into the MSRP, right? That's why nobody pays the MSRP when they go to buy a Chevy truck um, because that price is artificially elevated. So at the end of the year, they can offer this big rebate that gets you in the door the pharmacy, pharmacy benefit managers play the same game with large employers, um, and it might surprise you to know that Medicare itself is very involved in this game, and diabetics on the Medicare system actually subsidize the cost of everyone else's premiums in the Medicare system on the Advantage side. And the way that happens is essentially the diabetics end up overpaying for the insulin because the medication that is put in the formulary is the most expensive preparation of insulin. It's not the discounted cheaper version. It's the full freight version. And the reason for that is because if that's the one that's included in the formulary, that's the one that gets the biggest rebate. When the rebate comes back to the federal government, it doesn't go to the beneficiary. It goes straight to the Medicare trust fund and CMS uses that money spreads it around to basically lower premiums for everybody. Kind of a dirty trick. Large employers do the same thing. They'll negotiate a formulary based on rebate dollars that come back to me, the company, at the end of the year. So the drugs that you may have access to in your formulary are not necessarily driven based on what is the most cost-effective drug for you as a consumer to have access to. It's based on how much money is your employer gonna get back at the end of the year in terms of rebate dollars, which comes back to them through the HR department and they can essentially do whatever they want with that money. The state Medicaid system operates the same way. So I'm telling you all of this because it's important to understand that yes, the insulin is, is dramatically overpriced. Um, and because it's a drug that people literally die without, it becomes a very visible sign of a broken system. Um, but the system is broken because of the profiteering that's going on behind the scenes 
with the people who are actually benefiting from the negotiating. And that includes our federal government. Uh, there are lower cost versions of insulin that are out there, but guess what? They're not on any formularies. They're not even on the Medicaid formulary. Only the most expensive one is. So yes, I am working very hard to, to bring uh, significant discounts to people in Texas who may not currently have access to these discounts because they don't have one of these prescription drug discount cards. Um, and, I, and so that is something that is a high priority to me that we work that out. Thank you. That was a long answer to a short question. No, 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 a, I think it's an important one, so I appreciate it. Well, thank you. I know we're getting close to our hour mark and <clears throat> Chairman, I don't know if you have time to hang over for a little bit over at the 10 o'clock sure. mark. Um, but, and I, I already think we're gonna have to, we have to schedule you for a little later in the session too, to do a follow-up, but this is great. Um, I do wanna make sure we uh, address some transportation items um, before the end of the hour. So we could just, you know, you can run through yes, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. But <laughs> I figured, you know, the hot issues that we're, that we're kind of looking at, right? And you can kind of choose how you, so tolling, right? One, two, alternative fuel uh, uh, fee, right? For electric vehicles. Um, we know that's uh, something that's getting a lot of attention. There's some bills that have been filed for that. Um, additionally, keeping what we already have, right? So you mentioned kind of some, some uh, assurances that certain things will happen, not happen. It does seem that transportation is going to stay in the budget the way that it is. There is a rider that's in there. Um, I think it's 47 that we would just kind of want to draw your attention to that's, that some feel could be considered a diversion from transportation. Um, it has to do with the TERP funding. So we can dive into that um, with, your, with your team in a later conversation. But really it's, you know, kind of the tolling, the electric uh, fees, and then um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention safety. So um, that's a lot, but uh, I'm sure there's some strong answers on some of those. So if you want to kind of take it away, go right, go, go right ahead. Okay, well, full disclaimer. So the only time I ever get to vote on these issues is when they come to the House floor, because I don't sit on appropriations and I don't sit on transportation, much to Rob and T. Wayne's dismay, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, in the, in the, so my general belief on tolling I don't have a problem with toll roads, um, but what I have a problem with is on the backside, and I have personally been victimized by uh, companies that, you know, there's some issue with the credit card that they don't bother to resolve. You know, right. they wait until you have three violations before they let you know that you that they couldn't read your card when you went through. And I mean, I, one time I called Hectra and we and they told me about this and i'm like you're you're kidding me like how did how could i how would you not tell me and i have an easy tag why would you not rebuild it and they were like well you know it's the policy and we wait till you have three and then we send you a nasty letter and, and i'm like but i ignored that letter because i already have an account with you and i have a tag so why would you not well that's not the way we do it so we turn you over to this law firm yeah. And then, you know, now all of a sudden your $3.75 becomes $500, $503.75. And this literally, friends, is the only time that I've ever gotten kind of irate with a customer service representative and pulled the state rep card out and just said, I am going to hold your funding hostage next session until you deal with this. Um, I was so furious um, that that's the way that consumers are treated. So. The thing that gets my dander up on the toll issue, um, and I've been part of a bipartisan group that's kind of, you know, crusaded on this for a couple of sessions. Um, I really, really don't like, I, I like the simplicity of the easy tag. I'm perfectly happy to pay to ride the road, um, but you better not screw me over on the backside. You have my credit card number, you have, you know, in, you better not let administrative things get in the way and you sure as heck better not turn me over to some law firm that's profiteering off of $3.75 charges. Um, Cause that, that's just unforgivable uh, in my opinion. So um, with that being said though, look, I, I think toll roads are useful. Mm -hmm. um, I, my favorite example of course is, is Hardy toll road in 45, right? So if I'm in a real hurry to get to the baseball game, I'll take the Hardy toll road. 
Right. If I if I'm not in a real hurry, um, or if it's not a peak travel time, um, I'll take I-45, and I think that benefits I-45, and I think that benefits Hardy Full Road, and I think it certainly benefits the consumers that live in South Montgomery County and North Harris County because they have different mechanisms to get to where they need to go. The only time I've ever really seen the toll road thing kind of get abused is, you know, you do run into these situations where there are no options other than the toll road. Right. Um, and so my question in the situation like that always becomes, you know, if, if we're saying future growth will grow out around this toll road, and so everybody that moves out here essentially knows from day one that the main way to get into town is by toll road, then they're going to factor that into the price of buying a house in that community. Right. But to take over an existing road that people depend upon and try to turn that into a toll road, I think that's wrong. Um, I don't think that's fair to the, to the, the people. I don't think that's fair to the consumers. I would rather pay our fair share on the state side to make sure those roads are properly maintained. Because I do think we have a responsibility if there are roads that are already out there, not only to maintain them, but if people kind of built their lives around the idea that they would have quick access to free transport, you know, free mode of getting from point A to point B, then I think that's important to preserve. Okay, thank you, thank you. And I know we, again, we have reached a 10 o'clock mark. I'm, um, willing to kind of hang on for a few more minutes. So we have, because we have a few more questions. Um, I do appreciate you kind of reiterating the fact that you will not see some much of this legislation until it actually arrives at the house uh, floor. And so my sense is that, uh, my hope is that there is something that from the electric vehicle kind of conversation that does come together. I don't know that it'll look anything like either of the bills that have been Filed, right. I think my hope is that we kind of there's a, there's a discussion that's generated and something actually lands on the floor. But we we hope to follow up with you on that on that issue as that gets closer to movement that would involve a floor vote. Um, I know that um, Sally with Galveston City of Galveston was on and had a question related to Twia. So I don't know if she's on or not. Yeah, I see her. Hi, Sally. Okay. Uh, un unmute yourself. There we go. <laughs> I can't hear her. There Can you hear me now? I yes. can. How are you, Sally? I'm good. How are you, sir? I'm great. How did y'all fare with the ice storm last week? Oh, gosh. Uh, my poor Galveston Island had a very, very difficult time. We, um, we had 94% of our residents without power up to five days. 80% uh, of our pipes burst. We completely lost water supply. However, Gulf Coast Water Authority was tremendous in getting water to us. And of course, um, TEDM was wonderful in getting water down here. The state did a, a, a tremendous effort trying to address our issues, but um, it was a real struggle, but so many struggled throughout the state. I mean, it was, it was really a, an overwhelming event. Um, but I wanted to just take a moment to thank you for your leadership on house insurance and your efforts to address TWIA. Last session, HB 1900 passed and was significant legislation that um, Dr. Bonin worked on and um, Senator Taylor worked on on the Senate side. Part of that legislation was intended to create a funding structure board that would take the interim to examine TWIA funding structure and you know, uh, adjustments that needed to be made. TWIA made attempts this last fall to once again raise rates. Fortunately, that fell, that failed. In my view, I thought that was kind of a slap in the face to the legislature given the intent behind HB 1900. Unfortunately, due to COVID, that funding structure board was never able to meet and complete its work. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on the committee's uh, approach priority with continuing that work and extending that work into the next interim. That's a great question, Sally. So 
my number one priority with TWIA is to make sure that TWIA is still around in 20 years and that TWIA is still able to fulfill its mission, which is to provide that insurance coverage along the coast that we know the traditional insurance market, it, it's prohibitively expensive and it just doesn't work, right? We wouldn't necessarily need to have a TWIA if, we, if the market was able to sort of handle this on its own, but it's not. And so that's why we need TWIA. And so what mostly concerns me about TWIA is just how do we get TWIA on some firm financial footing moving forward um, so that it continues to be the option, um, you know, the best option I would suspect for everyone that lives along the coast because it's, a, it's, an, it's an expensive risk to insure, right? I mean, it, We've and it's not just the fact that we're we're entering into or we're in right now. I would say a very active period of of storms and, and claims and damage and stuff like that. Um, but if there is this sort of you know it's coming right, and when it comes, it's catastrophic. Um, and so the question is, if we want to continue to have a coastal coastal communities and coastal development, which I would say the overwhelming or resounding answer is yes, we do. Um, the coast is an important part of our economy on so many levels. You know, whether you're talking about trade and um, transportation or you're talking about tourism or, or just, you know, residential communities, um, whatever it is, you know, that you're talking about, whether it's industry or hospitality or whatever, um, it's an important part. We, you know, we're one of the only states in the union that has a, a coastline, right? And, and what that brings to us in terms of economic uh, development is huge. Um, and, it comes, and it comes at a price. Uh, and we have to be willing to meet that price. The biggest, we're going to have a big discussion about queer. And I have to tell you, I'm not 100% sure exactly. I wish I could tell you right now, we're going to do this, this, and this. Um, but I think part of that is that we need to have that conversation. Um, we need to get everybody, and we need to really finish the work of that commission that kind of didn't really have a chance to kind of finish its work. I do think there are systemic problems with the funding structure. I don't particularly like the way TWIA funds itself. And I think that we've seen, you know, when you have multiple um, high loss events back to back to back, this business of, of recouping money or, or, to, or getting money to pay claims by, you know, issuing publicly serviced debt is probably not the best mechanism. Um, because, you know, the idea behind that was essentially you would sell debt and then you would retire that debt and then you'd be ready for the next storm. Well, we, we're in a period of activity now where we don't, there's no opportunity to retire the debt, right? You don't get that five, 10 year window where there's no claims really being paid where you have the ability to retire the debt. So now we have this debt snowball that's kind of on top of TWIA and we have to help get them out from under that, I think. Um, I also think that the reinsurance component is an important backstop for TWIA, but I really don't think reinsurance is a first dollar or even a second dollar when you're talking about paying claims. You know, the, I, I think in some respects that reinsurance kind of takes the place of uh, publicly financed debt when you get to a catastrophic loss. You know, that's how reinsurance works. You're going to see post this storm that we just went through reinsurance is going to have a huge role to play because I will promise you that the property and casualty companies in Texas don't have the capital resources to pay every single one of those claims. But you know what? They all have reinsurance policies and they're going to have to tap into them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how they're going to get everybody's claim paid. But again, reinsurance is kind of what you, that's the last level of the cake, you know, in, in terms of that's where you go to last when all other things are exhausted. And that continues to make reinsurance premiums affordable. Um, and so I think that's a, th those are just some thoughts I have, but to be honest, Sally, I think, you know, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I think it's a very complicated thing. Um, I do think that we all need to, as a state, have a conversation 
because um, I do have legislators that have filed bills to sort of make Quia do other things just because they're kind of angry that, you know, they're from the panhandle and why are they having, why are their people having to pay into Quia? I think we have to make a, a decision about, you know, I'd kind of like to have a, a, a show of hands of, of who in the legislature thinks that the economy um, or, you know, that what the coast brings to our economy is important. Um, because if you if you think that's important and you want to continue to have access to the port of Houston um, and, and other things like like that, uh, then there's a price to be paid, and this is part of the price. I'm I'm grateful to hear that. You're absolutely right. Coastal communities produce 35% uh, of the state's domestic product. 25% uh, of the jobs are uh, generated on, in coastal communities. Uh, we bring a significant um, treasure to the state economy. Um, my Galveston, you know, our port is the fourth largest uh, cruise line port in the nation, uh, 11th, 12th in the world. Um, so we, um, we bring a lot to this economy. And um, my hope is at a minimum, and I understand that the difficulty of this session, but our, my hope is that the legislature will view the work that was uh, started with HB 1900, extend that and send the message to TWIA, this is a priority and we expect to examine this closely during the interim. That would be great. And of course, the expertise you bring to this committee is huge and we're very, very fortunate to have you and we're very fortunate to have our representative Mays Middleton on that committee now too. Yep, we're very glad that Mays is on the committee as well. And Sally, my promise to you is that we are gonna have a hearing. We are gonna consider the bills that have been filed on TWIA and we're gonna do you know, what's best for TWIA, um, make sure that it's around for our coastal residents for decades to come. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thanks. I can take one more question, Andrew, and then I got to jump off. Yeah, actually, I think we, I think we have to go. <laughs> so, oh, we have to go. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I take too long answering uh, questions. I no, think. but I, um, I really appreciate this, and I do encourage, and I mean this. Um, if there are questions that did not get answered, to please uh, email them to me. Um, re I can get you in touch with um, the chairman's staff. Um, they've been great in, in real time kind of communication. So, um, and I know that we will schedule another one of these for later in session, certainly. Um, this has been great. So we've covered a lot of different issues and I really appreciate your time today and um, good luck with everything. It's, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot that you have to think about and you have to know. Um, and we really appreciate um, just the fact that you take that, so you take that job so seriously and you really um, are very thoughtful about uh, all that you're doing in Austin for us. So with that, um, I do want to remind everybody We've got a couple more of these this week. So tomorrow we have Senator Jose Menendez. Uh, Wednesday we have Senator Charles Schwartner. And then Friday we have Representative Celia Israel. So we've got a lot. Uh, there are a lot of makeups from the storm week. So we've got a lot this week. So uh, look forward to continued conversations with you, Chairman. Yeah, uh, Celia's on my committee too. So ask her some tough insurance questions. I, we will. We will. We'll Sally's going to ask Celia Sally's Israel gonna... where she is on Twio, okay? <laughs> Sally's I will Sally. indeed. I'm looking at Sally. Sally's on all of these with us. So she's great. So, um, all right. Well, thank you with that. Everybody have a great day. Have a great Monday. Um, and we really appreciate everyone's time and chairman, best of luck to you. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. it. Nice to see you, Andrew. Thank Bye you. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.